Okay, let's pray. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can meet via Zoom to study about chronology and all that you've been revealing to us concerning it. And I pray that uh, what we do here tonight is profitable in understanding this aspect of your word and the light that you're bringing forth to us at the end of this here world's history. We give thanks for the great sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. May all the glory be to you and um, give thanks for all that you've done in our lives. Bring healing to me as well as I present this. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so uh, working back from history, 721, I think I had shared this. It's maybe a bit messy looking at it initially. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually, I haven't put 721 in here. So this is just going from uh, 726 BC. So this okay. is like J January to December here. And then we have um, September to September count. And then like a March to March, April, you know, the spring to spring count. Yeah. And, um, Basically, the issue of the fourth year is uh, of Josiah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is when Hezekiah had his Passover. The suggestion is that uh, Hezekiah is now counting from um, on a, a fall to fall count. Mm -hmm. And this is his first year. And then Hezekiah He's, uh, he just like maybe had a, like a short accession year. Maybe uh, Ahaz dies. Okay. And, uh, this would be 727. And then this is be, be the 15th year of Ahaz. So we know he reigns uh, 16 years. The understanding is it could be like... Um, just over 15 years, but it's like uh, rounded up to the yeah. 16th year. Okay. And uh, so Hosea, he begins to reign in the 12th year of Ahaz. So roughly coming in, in the 730 BC, in the fall. So that was, there's no accession year, so that would be uh, his first year then to the next fall, to the 13th year. And then, uh, so this is just tracing back the first year of Ahaz, be 7, 20, 741 BC, and the, uh, in March, the spring to spring count for him. And so, um, his accession year then would maybe begin sort of after the, the March, April time period. And this would be the, the time when he would be before meeting Isaiah and receiving the prophecy concerning the 65 years. Okay, so are you having Hezekiah with a, or Ahaz with a fall to fall rain or a spring to spring? No, no, spring to spring. Okay. So, um, but this is his accession year until the spring. Okay. So Jotham, in the 15th year of Jotham, uh, he dies. And then it's the accession year of Ahaz. So again, Jotham reigns 16 years. And I'm saying that, that there's rounded up as well. So it's just over... He would die. He would uh, reign. Uh, he would die in the sixteenth year. Okay. So and then this is the vision of the or the prophecy concerning the sixty-five years, seven forty-two, which begins to 
the prophetic mirror. Okay. And then you can go back to the first year of Jotham. Would be in uh, seven. So this is a uh, seven fifty eight BC. So this is when Pekka smote Pekka Aya, Pekka Aya, and reigned in his room in the, in the two and fiftieth year of Azariah. Which is Uzziah. <laughs> yes, which is Uzziah I have here. So, so I've considered that just the first year then. Um, so that's happening sometime maybe around the summer or early spring or something. And then it's uh, the second year of Pekiah is uh, again from fall to fall. And then Isaiah dies in his 53rd year after reigning 52 years. So his is uh, maybe like rounded down. So because we know he reigns 52 years, so, but he maybe reigns, in, I'm sorry, maybe dies just in his uh, 53rd. But it says that Jotham begins to reign in the 50th Isaiah. They both, they both begin to, both uh, uh, Pekka slays Pekahia, and also uh, Jotham begins to reign in the same year as the 52nd year of Uzziah. That's my understanding. Well, we don't have that information, I don't think. We have it in the second year of Pekka, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Okay. And okay. it's Pekka who begins in the 52nd year. So I'm... Oh, oh, and Pekka, oh, Pekka. Yeah, so Pekka begins in the... Right, so Pekka begins in the... Yeah, I was getting mixed up. So Pekka begins in the 52nd year of Uzziah, right? And um, then Jotham, he begins to reign. Well, Uzziah dies in his 52nd year. But you're saying it's the second year. That's because uh, Pekka does not have uh, an accession year, right? Yes. So he counts his first year. Um, so what is the verse I have here? Um, um, uh, oh, I'm lucky that's not going to work. It's written out somewhere, but yeah, so Pekka is going to, um, yeah, so he's going to kill Pekka Haya in the 52nd year. And then it says that um, Jotham, in the second year of Pekka, Jotham begins to reign. Okay. Yeah. So. But we're assuming that it's going to be in the 52nd year of Uzziah, so that there is an overlap there. So Jotham is counting his reign spring to spring. Pekka is counting it fall to fall. And so it's, there's going to be about six months difference between, because remember, Jotham is going to have an accession year, but you're going to move this further apart. Uh, well, I just don't, all I'm all I'm doing is saying that uh, Isaiah dies not far into his fifty third year. Yeah. Okay. So he reigns. He reigns fifty two years, but uh, he dies not far into his fifty third year. Yeah, but why not just put the accession of Jotham in the fifty second year of Uzziah? Then you don't have to put that. Uh, part of the 15th year at the end. I mean, there's no reason I see to to do this because the second year is going to start in the fall of 758. 
So Uzziah, Uzziah just needs to die sometime between September and April of 758 for Jotham to begin to reign. And then in the spring, his first year is going to begin in the spring of 757. That's, that's well, all I'm saying. Okay, so that could be a possibility. Yeah, I just, just don't see the need of doing that. Um, yeah, so we'll just maybe shift it slightly then. Yeah. But then, that, so this would be his first year? year yeah, then, that would be his year. first year. And yeah. The succession year, maybe around here? Yeah. So that's, that's how I have it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they're, they're about six months apart is my understanding of Jotham and and Pekka, that they're staggered in that way. And and that's and that's why when we have this, because um, we're gonna have Pekka reign 20 years, remember? And it's gonna be in the 20th year of Jotham, even though he's been dead for four years, that we're gonna count when Hoshea kills uh, Pekka, right? So if you move that all down, that puts the 20th year of Ahaz, or of, of Jotham, pardon me, it puts it uh, way past the, the years of Pekka. Unless you're just going to argue that they're going to count Pekka's reign, you know, like as he reigns 20 years, but they're going to count the whole span as being 20 years, because it's really kind of like 19 years, I guess. We don't know exactly when in the year that he's killed by Hoshea. But anyway, that that's me being really picky. Uh, I I think though it makes more sense. And it's okay, more so consistent. I have to, yeah, I haven't put in Pegas twentieth year here, so I'd have to consider that. Yeah. And then just add that to the uh, to the yeah. structure just to get an idea. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I'll end that. Okay, so so that it works out good. Otherwise, you know, so. And, and and we we show this for people people watching this um, that that it's quite a complex puzzle that there isn't just a simple straightforward solution uh, to it all but there are some things we do know for certain and other things we don't um, and and it seems to be that because they choose to count the death of Pekka by Hoshea in the twentieth year of Ahaz. I take it as the position that Ahaz is counting his reign fall to fall, which which you don't quite have. You have more a uh, or do you, yeah, you have moved spring to spring, where I have a move fall to fall, which solves some other problems as well. Um so uh but, but that's the reasoning I have why they choose Ahaz's count, and then that fits really well. And then, in a sense, we have two counts for Ahaz. You could continue to count him uh, spring to spring if you wanted to. Um, and that kind of gives us his 16 years of reign. But really, it's it's more 15 years because of the fall to fall count. So instead of sort of having that 15th year half reign there, it's just it's 16 years if he was counting the proper way spring to spring but he's already been counting fall to fall so and, and and the reason i would do that is i don't think that hezekiah would have chosen to go to a fall to fall reign because that would be a type of rebellion to some degree that ahaz is making when he chooses to count his reign fall to fall um so ahaz chooses to do that and hezekiah carries on with that count that that's the position that that i have so it's uh, now just uh, before you go over there, we look at Ezekiel's prophecy. I'll just show my chart here. So I'm going to just share my screen if that's OK. And we'll go back sharing yours. So with my chart here, I know it's a, it's a little bit tiny. Um, but so I'll zoom in a bit. But what you see just to take this whole span of time is I have. Uh, you're going to have Pekka begin in the 15th and second year of Uzziah and and then Jotham his reign is going to be in the second year of Pekka so Stephen was putting this like an accession year um so 
it's it's going to be his first year, which is going to line up with the second year. And then we're going to see the 20th and the 20th here. So this is the 20th year of Pekka, and this is the 20th year of Jotham, even though he's been dead for four years. So then... Um, Let's move it this way. And then you're going to see here, um, we have lined up the same way. Um, you're going to have the, this here is the actual spring to spring count. So the first year of Hezekiah is going to be the fourth year of Hoshea. And so the spring of 726 is going to be that Passover in the second month, Passover in the second month. So, but I know we still probably aren't finished with this puzzle. <laughs> okay, so you can go back to your yours there, Stephen. Okay, so um, this is like a critical look at the, the prophecy that uh, we find in Ezekiel chapter 4, 4 to 6. Uh, I'll just read it here. It says, Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it. Thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shall thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. For I have appointed thee a day for a year. So these 390 days, we understand that um, they culminate in the siege of Jerusalem in the, early in the year 587 BC. And the siege then goes on for about a year and a half. But counting back, it will take us to 977 BC and the death, the year where Solomon dies and um, Rehoboam becomes a king, and then the kingdom is divided. And I uh, just want to note that Usher here, he takes the 390 years and has them culminate in the destruction of Jerusalem. Is that right? Yes. And, and, and that, um, so anytime I've seen anybody connect the 390, to Ezekiel's prophecy in that way, they're gonna they're gonna have it end with the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but um, I'm trying to think exactly how Usher does this. So Usher has 975 for the dividing of the kingdom, and he has the destruction of Jerusalem in 588. So I'm not really sure how he does that. Um, maybe he doesn't deal with the 390. Because, you know, if you take a five or 975, I should say. So he has 975 for the dividing of the kingdom minus 588. He's going to be end up with 387 years. So I, I don't know. Oh, if no, no, you're, you're saying you're saying, saying something not right there. Okay. You're, what's saying, that? you're saying like 588 or something there. That's what he has for the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Okay. So, and he has 975 for the dividing of the kingdom. Right, okay. So that's only 387 years. So I'm not sure that Usher even interprets this prophecy. But there are people who use Usher and modify it a bit and then try to get the 390 to go to the destruction of Jerusalem. So one such is um, um, Floyd Nolan Jones. So... So he has 975, and then he has the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm trying to think how he does it. 
I think he has 586. And so that gives you 389 years and he just does it inclusively. So I think that's what Floyd Nolan Jones does. Um, but there aren't many people who connect the 392, the dividing of the kingdom and and Ezekiel's prophecy is connected to the destruction of Jerusalem or the siege or anything. Uh, there's only a few people that I could find that even tried to apply the 390. Most tried to add the 390 to the 40 to get a 430 and then try to apply it in some way. So. Okay. Um, so the 390 years <clears throat> we take us back to the passage in first kings chapter 12 uh, verses 26 to 13 verse 5 and uh, this is the story of the two calves being set up so we're not going to have to read it all you know we just know that this is when the, the kingdom is divided and we have here a false um a false day of atonement with the 15th day of the eighth month, which we understand is a symbol of August 15 and the midnight cry with the presentation of Samuel Sloan in the Exeter camp meeting in 1844. <coughs> so we, we see that Ezekiel is very much uh, already has a a lot of has a, a connection to the second angel's message, and there, there is more as we read on. Um, so Ezekiel here begins. Just, just, just read this footnote here, just see what I'm saying. So Ezekiel, when referring to the captivity of Jehoiachin, counts fall to fall as if Jehoiachin is still reigning. Otherwise, his dating is based upon the reign of Zedekiah and the spring to spring reign. And both are to be reckoned from 597 BC. And the 30th year of Ezekiel, 1-1, is the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle, beginning in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. So that would be at 622. BC. And you also have some Ellen White quotes uh, where she connects the birth of Daniel as well. It could be that year as well, or um, even the year previously where they find the Book of the Law. So maybe that could be significant in some way. So okay, just, just to go back, Stephen, sorry. So I'm just looking in Usher's Annals of the World. And so he does connect the 390 years in, and he does it to the 15th day of the eighth month in 975 BC. But he doesn't show what the end is, but it doesn't really make much sense um, to me that he's going to count the because he's going to put this in 588. Um, so what is he doing here? So he's got 588. I don't know. I, I don't know how he connects 975 to um, the 390 years to anything, even though he says, he says that he doesn't give the end point. So he doesn't say where he's marking the end of it. Right. So he doesn't, he just gives the starting point. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of odd. Okay. Sorry about interrupting you there. Oh, no, that's, that's good to point that out. Yeah. Uh, so um, we have here a, a prophecy in the first Kings. So this is 977 BC, the understanding going back 390 years uh, from the beginning of the siege in 587. And it's uh, Josiah by name 
this is a, a prophet that comes from Judah and goes to Bethel. Our understanding that he's in Bethel here. And um, he says, Josiah by name, and upon thee he shall offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave the sign the same day, saying, This is the sign spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when Jeroboam heard, it, heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold upon him, and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up. So he could not pull it in again. The altar was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So we have in this here year, on the 15th day of the eighth month, a prophecy concerning Josiah. Now, it's, it's going to be roughly fulfilled um, about 350 years later. Mm -hmm. If we, uh, it's still understanding, we're going to suggest. So these events occur in 977 BC, several months after the division of the kingdom earlier in the year. Um, it is to this year that the 390 years of Ezekiel 4 5 directs us as to the beginning and the commencement of the siege of Jerusalem. So we have mentioned that. And um, so we have. I have here Ezekiel's when he begins his uh, book, which is the fifth day of the fourth month, and uh, he begins his book on the the twenty first of July, five ninety two BC, in the Julian calendar. If we are to understand that Ezekiel was to lie on his left side for three hundred and ninety days from that date, the date which he would turn on his, to lie on his right side would be the 15th of August, 591 BC, a date which can also be expressed as the 15th day of the eighth month, albeit in another calendar. So this is a, my picture of Ezekiel here. He lies on his left side, 390 days. And, uh, these here go back to the 15th day of the eighth month in 977 BC. But at the end of these here, 390 days, takes us to the 15th of August in 591 BC. And he begins on the 21st of July in 592 BC in the Julian calendar, which we understand is midnight in uh, 1844. It was midway between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. And this is uh, a date that Ellen White uh, specifies in the Great Controversy. And then the 40 days on his right side, uh, in the sense he's, he's looking back at this year date. So that's the sort of the, the focus. He's looking to this year date, he turns on his right side, and then he's 40 days looking back, in a sense, to this year date. So that's the uh, suggestion that uh, we get from Ezekiel here. So a question one may ask is why did 390 years applied to the Northern Kingdom of Israel when it would be no more appropriately, when it would more appropriate, appropriately apply to Judah? The Northern Kingdom of Israel had come to its end in 721 BC when the king of Assyria did, castle, did carry away Assyria, sorry, could carry away Israel onto Assyria, and put them in Hala, and in Habor, by the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. One must therefore reckon that this prophecy is not specifically about how many years the kingdoms of Israel and Judah went on for, but is tying events together, but is tying together events 390 years 
or 40 years prior to the siege of Jerusalem? Would that be the way you understand it? Um, yes. Now, there's some other points here um, uh, that uh, I have in one of my papers, which uh, um, addresses this, this issue. So, because they're, they're going to bear the iniquity, right? And, and the question has to do with the element of the comparison between the 40 years that Israel is in the wilderness and the 40 years here of, for Judah, and, and that, there, that there is a similarity. So when we think about this prophecy, we use it as a day for a year, and we, we tie these two together. So the one is in, um, uh, what's what's the verse that the other one's in? A day for a year, a day for a year. Oh, Numbers know. 34. Um, is it 28 or something? Or? 34. Um, oh, as far as it, 28. <laughs> uh, maybe it's I always forget. There's supposed 14, to be a way that 14, I remember. 14, 38. Numbers 1438. 1438. Yeah. yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that. Or 1434. Maybe I'll say yes. Okay, let me see if that's correct. Yeah. So after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So the fact that this day for a year is given, and it has to do with the bearing of the iniquities, I mean, we can't ignore this, that we can't just say uh, what this bearing of the iniquities, we'd have to, to understand it. Now, this prophecy is given regarding the four, 40 years, not before the 40 years commence, but two years into the 40 years, correct? Yes, I'd say just over a year and a bit, really. You know, yeah. It's kind, it's kind of just two years. Yeah, they often say 38 years, right? So um, that they're going to then wander in the wilderness. Now, um, so that means it is a predictive time prophecy that has all the beginning has already happened. Now, what, what people will argue is they'll say, well, these 40 days that the spies uh, spied out the land, because that's going to be the basis for the 40 years, um, is that that you're going to be giving these day for a year in sort of a reverse order. That is, they're going to bear the iniquity for 40 years to mark the 40 days. But in Ezekiel, he's going to lie on his side for 40 days to bear the iniquity, marking the 40 years. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That it appears to be a reversal. Okay, so um, now the study that I have this in, uh, so I wish I remember which paper it's in, um, because I'm going to answer this question, and and I had done a good job of it in one of my papers, but I don't remember which paper it is now. Um, Let me see. I have too many papers to look through. So I'll, I'll try to do my best with it. So let, let's go um, to Ezekiel then. Here, can, can I bring up the verses just so I can go between them? I'll share my screen. Okay. So when we look at this one in numbers, again, so it's numbers um, 14 verse 34. After the number of the days which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year. Now, in Hebrew, it says a day to a year, a day to a year. So it's, it's a doubling. Shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And then when we go to Ezekiel chapter 4, <clears throat> um, 
For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, verse 5, according to the number of the days, 390 days, shall, sh sh shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I've appointed thee each day for a year. So the question is, why is this apparently reversed? Why are the days the days in which you bear the iniquity? Um, and both of them, of course, are starting, are, are pointing to a period that's already in process. That is, they're predicting an end point to something that has already started. Yeah, what's interesting yeah. is that the, pro the prophecy uh, or the yeah, the day for year scenario that we find in Numbers. Yeah. It's really about a year and a half in to yeah. uh, the 40 years. Okay. And then with Josiah, or sorry, with the prophecy of uh, Ezekiel. Yeah. It's, it's really like a year and a half to finish it. So you've really got in like 38 and a half years, roughly, has already taken okay. place. Um Okay, so he's, well, it's not a year and a half to finish it. He, he's four years. Oh, sorry, yes. Hi. Because um, he's yeah, in. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. But it's going to be a year and a half after the siege begins. Uh, so the year and a half is going to be after the end of the 40 years, not preceding the end of it. Okay, so... Um, Yeah, so what we have here, though, the question is, why are these reversed? Is there any significance in their reversal? Because this is often used as an attack. Well, it's like a mirror. Okay, it's, 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 it's a mirror, right? So that means we can connect this 40 years to the 40 years wilderness wandering. That is, they're not separated. They're not, they're not unrelated. They have a relationship, but they, they have a type of inversion that occurs. And they both are predicting, so they're both applying this. And notice he only says it in connection with the 40 days, right? So he, he mentions the 390 years, but it's really once he mentions the 40 days that he's going to then quote um, Numbers uh, 14, verse 34, correct? Um, sorry, say it again. So it's only only after he mentions the 40 days and the 40 years that he's going to then quote Numbers 14, 34. Right, so so he doesn't he doesn't say it twice. He doesn't say I've given you a day for a year in connection with the 390 and then a day for a year in the connection with the 40. He's just going to mention it in connection with the 40. So, so he in verse 5, he talks about the 390, and you're going to bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. 40 days I have appointed thee each day for a year. So he mentions that in connection with the 40 days, but not in connection with the 390. And that beca that's because he's connecting it with the 40 days and the 40 years, uh, the spies and the wandering in the wilderness. Just doing so, a bit of math there. So it was just that uh, we went, I was just seeing how many years. Yeah. <laughs> between them, because 1532, was the, the time period when uh, the spies went in yeah. the land. And it was 592 then when Ezekiel has this here day for year prophecy. Yeah. So there's like 940 years difference. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, maybe this came to mind the ninth day of the fourth month connected with that, which is... Um, yeah, the, the, the walls being yeah, broken. The down. walls come down. Now yeah. it's it's also um, four periods of two hundred and thirty five years, um, and the two thirty five is the number of years from the dividing of the kingdom 
to the captivity of uh, or to the prophecy of uh, the 65 year prophecy is 235 years. And then 19 years later, which is 235 months, uh, that's when Samaria is or when she is taken captive. Um, so I'm just saying that 235 times four is 940 years. So it's um, there's there's probably some kind of connection with that, but I haven't worked out all the different periods of 235 years. Okay. Okay, so we can. Now, um, I did find my argument here. So I'm going to read this. I'll put it up on the screen just because um, it's, it's not something I've really ever presented in this kind of detail. So here, here's the argument that I'm going to make. So, Okay, so it says, in Ezekiel's first vision, he is instructed to depict the city of Jerusalem under siege, right? So he's going to make this mock-up of the city of Jerusalem. He's going to put this iron pan for a wall between him and the city, and he's going to set his face against it. He's besieging the city, and that's one of the reasons why we mark the beginning of the siege as the end of the 390 years and the 40 years, because that's what he's predicting. He's not directly predicting the date for the destruction of Jerusalem. He does so indirectly, but he's directly predicting this date. He is then told to bind himself on his left side for 390 days. I should say days, not day. Face his depiction of the siege and then do the same while on his right side for 40 days. Now, in, in your picture, you have him on opposite sides of the city. What was the reason for that? Because I have him just flipping over the other way. Um, we had a discussion about this before. Okay, I suppose. Uh, well, if he's going to make this here siege, yeah, with this here like a model of the city. Yeah. No, if he if he flip right another way, it's going to be it's going to be at his back. So he well, no, be he just at it. No, he just flips over the other way, head to toe. Is what oh, I right, okay, I get you. Yes. I haven't flipped head <laughs> to toe. <laughs> well, so, so, I, so I would have put him in front of the city and had him, you know, lying head to head, so to speak, or toe to toe, uh -huh. in, in, in how I would depict it. But but that's just how I visualized it. Um, I suppose that's viable. Yeah. So then he's going to lie on his left side. So all these verses that we were familiar with, lie thou upon thy left side, lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I've appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore, thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from the one side to the other, to another, till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Some people have questioned whether he acted out this prophecy, and that it seems unreasonable for someone to lie on their side for such long periods of time, since he has also given directions for the food that he is to eat, we are certain that he is lying on his left and right sides, uh, that this line on his left and right sides occurs while asleep and not while he is awake. The purpose of all this is to be assigned to the house of Israel and was to be acted out in front of them as a witness and warning of what was to come. Since we know that later prophecies were acted out and seen by the people, it would be odd not to have this acted out. Its purpose would not be realized. The literal days that Ezekiel lies on his sides are symbolic of periods of years. The days that he lies on his left side mark the periods of Israel's iniquity. That is, they represent the 390 years 
from the dividing of the kingdom to the start of the siege. Ezekiel is asked to lie on his left side to bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, in that the Lord states, for I have laid upon thee the years of their, northern Israel's, iniquity, according to the number of the days. Ezekiel 4 verse 5. He does the same for Judah. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. The significance of the idea of a day for a year here in Ezekiel has been debated for centuries. It is a quote direct from Numbers 1434. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. The Hebrew has the phrase Yom Lahashana, Lom Lahashana, which is literally translated, a day to a year, a day to a year. The same doubling exists in Ezekiel. The context in Numbers 1434 is that God was telling the Israelites that they would have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years due to their rebellion. The 40 years is the result of the 40 days that the 12 representatives were silent or were sent ahead to spy out the land of Canaan prior to Israel entering the land. We even have the parallel to bearing iniquity. When we look at the time periods themselves, we can easily fit the 390 years from the dividing of the kingdom of Israel in 977 to the start of the siege in 587 BC. We illustrate this below. So there's just a simple diagram of this. Um, while we have an event that marks the commencement of the 390 years for the iniquity of the house of Israel, at this point, we have no such event to start the 40 years for the iniquity of the house of Judah. Since we have assumed that both periods end with the commencement of the siege in 587 BC, we must look for an event in 627 BC. And what could this event be? Ezekiel has, has been giving us clues. So, um, so you've mentioned some of these. One is the 30 years of the Jubilee cycle, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to give us this time frame that's going to tie us back to Josiah. So in the 30th year of, it doesn't say of what, and in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, that he's going to have this vision in Ezekiel 1.1. And, and I show here that this Jubilee cycle is going to go back to the year of Josiah's Passover. And that's going to be the 18th year of Josiah. But what we're going to have to do is um, tie this to an event that happens five years earlier. And that's going to be uh, seen in 2 Kings chapter 23. So um, now there was something here that I think maybe it was a footnote. Um, here, I'm just going to go back because I think it was in this paper that I address one of these points. Um, so it might be on the next page. No, I don't see it here. Okay, anyway, do you want to go on? You can share your paper and you can go on and explain this part. Okay. I'll try to see if I can find this. Uh, that's what I have to do. Okay, so I just have here the 40 years. I'll take this back to 627 BC, the siege. Mm -hmm. um, it takes us to the 13th year of Josiah, when Jeremiah began his prophesying. So Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anahoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth year, sorry, in the fifth month. So the span of time emphasizes, emphasized in these verses is 41 years, taking us from 627 to the summer of 586 BC. This is the only event 
the Bible identifies as occurring in the 13th year of Josiah. But a question arises as to what connection does the beginning of Jeremiah's prophesying have to do with the events of 977 BC. In each case, we can see a prophet bringing a message of judgment against idolatry. But other than that, there is not a clear, meaningful connection. Uh, the Bible does not give us information concerning, sorry, the Bible, however, does give us information concerning the 12th year of Josiah. That does seem to, that does seem more connected with the events of 977 BC. So we have here uh, two Chronicles, chapter 34. And Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty-one, one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves, sorry, uh, yeah, and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the elders of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut them, he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images, he brag in pieces and made dust of them and strewed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them and he burnt the bones of the priests upon their elders and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the, the graven images into powder, and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. So we have this here statement, he burnt the bones of the priests upon their elders. This is in the 12th year, according to the, the, mm -hmm. the scripture. But it says there, uh, I think I emphasize this later on, but he, uh, he began to purge Ju Judah and Jerusalem in the 12th year. So the argument then could be, that, that carried on to the 13th year. So here we see that Josiah burnt the bones of the priests of, upon their elders. This would seem to be a fulfillment of 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2, where we are told, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Okay, so then I, uh, so that's for some reason then you can maybe, it's not explicit that this is happening in the 13th year, but uh, we have sort of very similar language which would seem to tie in, uh, tie them uh, events together. Yeah, and in Second Kings 23, 15 there, when it uses that word moreover. So the context of Second Kings 23, is events that are happening in the 18th year of Josiah. Yes. So, so six years after he begins this work, um, but it puts it there in Chronicles, it puts it in the 12th year of his reign. And so when it says, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, that word moreover in Hebrew, it's talking about these reforms that are happening in, in 622, but it's going to go back to these events that began in the 12th year of his reign. Correct? That's how you look that's, at it? That's what um, yeah. we're suggesting. Yeah. So and and because the word of moreover says, you know, basically we would say, and in addition, he did this earlier. Right? So it's just kind of adding this to the list. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it looks as if it occurs in the 18th year. And I have that. Uh, 
So after he had motioned to have repairs made to the temple, the process of the repairs, the book of the law of the Lord was given by Moses uh, is found. This leads to a reformation and a further, further purging of idolatry. Uh, so 2 Kings 23 provides a catalog of these purges. So um, we have all these things, what he does. I'm not going to read them all. You know, just, uh, just temples of Baal or images of Baal and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, burn them and so forth. So I just have them sort of bullet pointed, you know, breaks down the house of the Sodomites and so forth. So we understand these things. Uh, generally happened in the 18th year. Mm -hmm. So after these actions, uh, a Passover follows and more purges are mentioned, but these would seem to be a recap of what had occurred uh, prior to the Passover. I um, just have a, a statement there. Uh, El Mike, she, uh, she makes a, uh, she discusses 2 Kings 23, uh, verse 24, and uh, she has that occurring as if it was prior to the Passover. <clears throat> so when you read it in 2 Kings 23, it's, you can think of well, this is happening afterwards, but uh, it's just like a recap. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's just that, just that recap. So in reading Prophets and Kings, Elamite would seem to connect fulfillment of the events of 977 BC, at the time of Josiah's reformation in his 18th year. Wouldn't, you, uh, wouldn't that be uh, 12th year? No. No? She, she, seems, she seems to connect it to his, his 18th year. So okay. uh, if we read that, Josiah and I propose that those who highest in authority uh, unite with um, the people in Solomonite I solemnly commenting covenant. Maybe you can read that just now. <laughs> just read there. Probably. Josiah now proposed that those highest in authority unite with the people in solemn, solemnly covenanting before God to cooperate with one another in an effort to institute decided changes. The king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. The response was more hearty than the king had dared hope for. All the people stood to the covenant. Yeah, just continue. In the reformation that followed, the king turned his attention to the destruction of every vestige of idolatry that remained. So long, as ha so long had the inhabitants of the land followed the customs of the surrounding nations in bowing down to images of wood and stone, that it seemed almost beyond the power of man to remove every trace of these evils. But Josiah persevered in his efforts to cleanse the land. Sternly he met idolatry by slaying all the priests of the high places. Moreover, the workers of the fam with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Okay, um. So in the days of rending the kingdom centuries before when Jeroboam the son of Nebat, in bold defiance of the God whom Israel had served, was endeavoring to turn the hearts of the people away from the services of the temple in Jerusalem to new forms of worship, he had set up an unconsecrated altar at Bethel. During the dedication of this altar, there were where many in years to come were to be seduced into idolatrous practices, there had suddenly appeared a man of God from Judea with words of condemnation for the sacrilegious, sacrilegious proceedings. He had cried against the altar, declaring, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. 1 Kings 13.2. This announcement had been accompanied by a sign that the word spoken was of the Lord. Three centuries had passed during the Reformation wrought by Josiah. The king himself 
The king found himself in Bethel, where stood this ancient altar. The prophecy uttered so many years before in the presence of Jeroboam was now to be literally fulfilled. The altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin, had made, both the altar and the high place he brake down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God had proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Second Kings 23, 15 to 18 is referenced. Okay, so, so Elamite and prophets and kings here, mm -hmm. he's talking about the fighting of the book of the law by Hilkiah, and then she goes uh, mm -hmm. to, to the days of the rending of the kingdom, centuries before, and she talks about this here, mm -hmm. uh, the events there at Bethel. So, and then she says, three centuries had passed, so that would be our understanding that that's more accurately about 350 years. Yeah. And then she says, during the Reformation wrought by Josiah, the king found himself in Bethel. So the context of the Reformation here is that- it You're connecting be, it to the reading of the, the Reformation that followed. So you could do that, yes. So mm. that that's I'm just saying that's the general context mm -hmm. of uh, of what uh, so that that would be the certainly the logical thing there. So uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the 18th year of Josiah would correspond to 622. So this would be 35 years prior to the siege and 355 years from the events of 977 BC, therefore it would not align with Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6. It does, however, connect the date of when Ezekiel begins lying on the side for 390 days, in that Ezekiel 1, 1 mentions the 30th year, being the fifth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, which relates to 592 BC, being 30 years from the Passover of Josiah. So just looking at the information we're given, that's like a, a diagram. Um, so this is 628 BC. We have the 12th year of Josiah, which we're suggesting goes into the 13th year when Jeremiah mm -hmm. uh, begins prophesying. And then this year, Book of the Law is found five years later. And then there's a reformation there as well. And further purges of idolatry occur. And then you have a 30 year period to when Ezekiel begins to prophesy. And then that's uh, five years then to the siege. So we have these 40 years go back to this 13th year. And it will be at the 390 years then to 977, and then that would leave 350 years then um, to uh, 627. Mm -hmm. So a solution, uh, an understanding that can be applied that would most likely link the events of 977 to 627, is that if we take the word moreover, I think you said that, uh, as akin to a parenthesis relating to what Josiah did in a previous time. Mm -hmm. And we just will bring the note there that he began to purge, which we said. And uh, 2 Chronicles 34 mentions that he went to the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim, Simeon, onto Naphtali. And uh, so we can connect uh, Bethel. Uh, Though it was originally part of Benjamin, became the territory of Ephraim by the time of Deborah and Barak. So he purges first Jerusalem and Judea, and then he goes to, to Ephraim. And uh, 
So we find that Bethel's uh, in Ephraim. We mentioned there Bethel and Mount Ephraim there in Judges 4-5. And you can maybe even see uh, Bethel being connected with Ephraim there in Hosea chapter 10, verses 11 to 15. So uh, by the time of Josiah, Ephraim or Israel had not been a kingdom for approaching uh, a century. But it seems that Bethel could have been associated with his domain. And it just mentions there 2 Kings 34. That um, this is in his 18th year when he breaks down the, the groves and so forth. Uh, he carries the ashes on, of them onto Bethel. Mm -hmm. uh, he could be just uh, removing them outside Israel, that's a possibility. But, um, so, um, so, 2 Chronicles 34 notes that the cities of Ephraim, of which Bethel, may have then still been associated. Therefore, after Josiah had begun the purging of the idols from Jerusalem and Judea in his 12th year, so I think we've covered up, he went on to proceed to Bethel and Ephraim and the other cities that were associated with that tribe, as well as to the cities associated with the other tribes mentioned in his 13th year, thus fulfilling the prophecy of 977 BC, providing a logical link to the 390 and the 40 years of Ezekiel, yeah. um, four, four to five, uh, five to six. Um, so among those who had hoped for a permanent re spiritual uh, revival as a result of the Reformation under Josiah was Jeremiah, called of God to the prophetic office while still a youth in the 13th year of Josiah's reign a member of the Levitical priesthood, Jeremiah had been trained for, from childhood for holy service. So in this passage, we see Josiah's reforms mentioned alongside Josiah's 13th year and Jeremiah's call as a prophet. The wording, though general, allows the prospect that as a godly youth, Jeremiah witnessed the reforms associated with the purges of idolatry that began in Josiah's 12th year and had hoped that they would have had an enduring aspect. So just like the potential support there um, for that uh, 13th year of the, uh, the purges continuing. And uh, so half here, the 390 in the 40 year. Now, now one, one other thing, um, Stephen, so uh -huh. when we look at Ezekiel chapter four, five, and six, there's all kinds of references uh, to Leviticus 26, especially in chapter five and six, which is a continuation of that. Um, can we connect that this period of time and this prophecy is in some way connect, some ways connected with the 2520? Well, I have already, I have a wee footnote here. Um, okay. That suggests that. So in okay. considering the spans brought to view in the prophecy, that is 350 years that end in 627 BC, the 40 years that begin there, if we were to include the span of 1.5 years from the siege until the destruction of Jerusalem, as well as the previous 120 years of the kings of the United Kingdom and the dispensing with the zeros and multiply these numbers, we get uh, 2520. Okay. So we have 12. So that would be like 120, 120, 120 years for Saul, David and Solomon. The 35 uh, connected to the 350 years to 627. And then uh, four for the 40 years. And then uh, 1.5 for the uh, the time period of the siege. So you just multiply them together and you get 2520. Okay. And then, yeah, the destruction of Jerusalem of 586 was the fulfillment of the seven times. 
and identifies a period of 70 years from the destruction of the temple in that year until the, the construction of the second temple in 516. Mm -hmm. um, so would that be support for yeah 2520 yeah that would be support for the 2520 self so so remember we have um manessa's captivity in 77 um and then we're going to have um, this this period of seventy years. Now that period of seventy years is going to end with the captivity of Daniel, and then we get another period of seventy years. But it's the failure of Josiah's reforms that are going to lead to Daniel's captivity. So. So this is a Josiah's reforms occur in a period of time that is being allotted for reform. And and they're gonna fail because he goes to war against e Egypt. You you have the numbers there that, that connect this, but we can also see that it's connected um, in the themes that are there that this is part of the progressive destruction of four. That is, it happens in that first generation, the first period of 70 years. So it says, if you're not reformed by these things, then wild beasts will rob you of your children. And that's what's going to happen. So they're in that period of time from uh, Manasseh's captivity to his reform, and then um, his grandson's reform under Josiah, they're still going to fail. They're going to fail to complete the first seven times, um, you know, to have it do its proper work. So that was kind of more what I was thinking about, but um, but I like the numbers there. Taking the, I mean, if you don't take out the zeros, you just get four zeros at the end. That's all of twenty five twenty, and then well, actually three zeros. Right. So yes. you get two fifty two and four zeros. But yeah. Yes. If you add them together, you get 52.5, which is maybe like a symbol of the 525. Yeah, days. okay. So that connects it to the 777. So you're saying if you add 12 plus 35 plus 4 plus 1.5, you get 52.5. And that 52.5 is that inversion or iteration of the 2520. But the two added together create the 777. Yes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, conclusion, though the 390 years have been correlated with the period of the kings of Judah, uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel 4 has otherwise not been understood in the history of Christendom. As God has been progressively unsealing prophecy as we approach the end of this world's history, we can see the potential of the prophecy concerning Josiah in 977 BC, meeting its fulfillment in 627 BC, thus providing significance to the prophecy of Ezekiel 4. The evidence may not be able to be proven conclusively, but it offers the most probable, uh, comprehensible uh, solution. Yeah. So I think it's, it's something more we can see by faith, you know, that. For it to have any meaning at all, really, this is the only thing that would uh, that would provide it, you know, that understanding, you know. Uh, um, and if it was discernible prior to that, you know, that I think this is something that God's just unsealing as we approach the end of this world's history. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see these things. I know if it was more clear, it would have been maybe seen prior you know, to that. So it's just something that God had specifically required to open up uh, this year time. Yeah. Now, a couple of other things here, uh, just before you uh, go into something else, just 
when we we deal with this period of time that we we have the prophecy given in the 15th day of the eighth month in 597 now we of course know that the kingdom is divided prior to that right i mean it's it's probably going to be in the spring um that we're going to have this battle uh between northern and southern israel that uh, or that decision that's being made that they're going to make uh, jeroboam the king of northern israel because you're going to have solomon die maybe in december or something of uh 598 and then um, Rehoboam becomes king as the son of Solomon and then there's going to be this conflict that goes on and then we know that by the fall he's already has these golden calves built in in Bethel and Dan and that he's going to then worship on the altar and it appears that this is kind of like the inauguration of so that he's sort of planning for this event the the this 15th day of the eighth month and he's a king acting as a priest so there's some symbolism in there as well but um you know if you count from there and you're going to count to the siege well you're really going to have about 39 years and a few months for the 390 years Right, because you're going to be looking at something way in in the fall of, you know, like in, well, November 22nd, particularly, specifically, Mm -hmm. in 597. And something happening in January, the beginning of January in 587. And so some people could argue, because we're looking at this critically, they could argue, well, that's 39 years and whatever it's going to be, it's going to be like a, a couple of months, maybe. Because it's uh, you know the tenth day of the the tenth month that the siege begins, so it's about two months later, less than two months later, that you're going to have it. So it's just two months over thirty nine years, and they'll say, well, that or three hundred ninety years, pardon me, um, so three hundred eighty nine, three hundred eighty nine. Yeah, I'm yes. thinking forty years. So three hundred eighty nine. So it doesn't really line up. Three hundred eighty nine years, and it says three hundred ninety. Um, and, and then you also have the 40, the 40 years. I mean, you know, it, you could argue, well, you know, again, you're starting with this siege in January. And again, you know, it would be a shorter period of time. Now, you could, of course, count from the 12th year instead of the 13th year. And, you know, the thing is, it's not a precise day to day prophecy. It is you don't have one specific date starting and another specific date ending it. Other than that, when the siege occurs, uh, Ezekiel is to- told to write down this day, even this day, because he's marking the date in which his prediction was fulfilled. Because um, he doesn't know the date when it's going to happen, when the siege is going to happen. He just knows it's 390 years and 40 years. Uh, but when the siege occurs, he's 500 miles away, and he's told to write this down, that the siege had begun. And, and we know connected with all this, he's going to be told that, um, that he's going to be made dumb until somebody returns from the destruction of Jerusalem who has seen it. And so he's going to have to wait really two years until he knows that Jerusalem is destroyed, because that's going to be a year and a half to the destruction of Jerusalem and then another six months uh, to the escapee coming to him. So it, it's it's a rather interesting uh, how this this whole prophecy all fits together. But you know, somebody looking at it critically could could always kind of poke holes in it. But as as you say, I think it's the most reasonable uh, sort of way to understand this prophecy, even if it's not as precise as we would like, or that we don't have that, you know, clearly stated. Um, argument but you put all the pieces together it 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 definitely gives you the most clearest picture um we have we know that josiah has he is a for the fall brian yeah so if he's beginning to do in that purging in his 12th year 
Yeah. Say, say if it's, you know, it's, it's maybe not really like the first day of his 12th year or whatever, it's going to take some time yeah. for him to do that purges. So it's pretty much likely to go into the 627. Yeah. BC, you know, if he's beginning at the sort of end of the year, it's going to take away into the 627. Mm -hmm. So yeah, was, yeah he'd, he'd probably do it more in the spring, but, but it's hard to say, yeah. So even just having an S12 here then would um, can, can bring it in there. Yeah. Yeah, I know. 350 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just like a timeline that we have of Josiah. And uh, guys aged 39 at uh, Megiddo. So I just have a suggestion here that the Battle of Megiddo in 609 BC is a type of the end of the world, namely the Battle of Armageddon of Revelation mm -hmm. 1616, as is the siege and destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, beginning after 390 years of the reigns of Judah's kings. So with Josiah being aged 39, that battle mm -hmm. being a tenth of the 390 years, it could be a further hint that Josiah relates uh, to the prophecy of mm -hmm. Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. And I don't mention it, but we also have the uh, 391 years and 0.5 months of a month of Josiah Litch. Yeah. So it's just like there's just another logical connection that uh, this year, 390 years, ties in with Josiah. Yeah. And then, of course, we have Ezekiel, the 10th day, the fifth month, and how that all ties together. And uh, the 666 years of Jehoiachin's captivity, ending with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, so there's lots of different tie-ins, right? Mm -hmm. Not that uh, Josiah is captive for 666 years. It's only 36, but it connects to that period. So if we counted the years of his captivity, it would end in 70 AD as 666. So, so there's all different sorts of tie-ins and different details. Now, for me personally, part of it had to do with the chronology that was being worked out of the kings of Judah and Israel. And um, so this was to me a confirmation that we had worked out this chronology correctly. Because part of the problem, like, even as I read in Usher, he has 390 years for the iniquity of the house of Israel beginning in 975, but he, he doesn't explain how it's ended um, because he doesn't have the correct chronology. If he would have had, you know, 977, if he would have had our chronology, he might have actually connected this. But the problem that everyone had is they, they didn't have anything to connect it to. So they didn't really know why it ends. And he's shortening the reign of the kings. Of the he's, uh, he runs into lots of other problems and try to uh, align the years of kings as well. He's got a shorter time period to try to fit. Chooses those dates. Um, a lot of this has to do with his theory regarding 4004 BC because he has to have... Uh, the spring e or the fall equinox uh, occur on a Sunday because he believes that the world's going to begin with the fall equinox on the first day of the week. Um, and, and that's going to begin this calendar that he believes it's a calendar that goes from equinox, fall equinox to fall equinox, and that we don't get the, the Babylonian calendar until the captivity. So, so he has some theories that he's trying to work out. And so he, he fudges things a little bit to work out his different theories, just like many people do when they're doing chronology. Um, I, I checked out for 46 BC, 4046. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't work for uh, the first day of the seventh month, whatever, being a Sunday. So, but you wouldn't sort of say that that mattered? In, in, in 40, 46 BC? 
No, yes. because, um, well, because I'm not count. I don't know what the date, what what they're starting it on. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the calendar that the world is created on. Yes. Right, just created. So I'm I'm not giving any specific date, like the first day of the first month or the first day of the seventh month, um, that the world is created on. Um, you know, it, it could be, all, all I know is it's created on the first day of the week in 4046 BC. Yes. Okay, so uh, that will finish us off today. Okay. Okay. So, well, thanks a lot. And uh, let's close with prayer. Okay. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for uh, the Sabbath and um, for the time that we had to study these things. We're thankful for the light that's been given this message. We just pray that we can continue to look into these things, that you can correct any errors we may have in our understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Recording stopped. Yeah, so not many people.